So what I plan to do now, partly we were sort of joking about that after lunch lull when we're all kind of full and a little bit tired and maybe you didn't have a coffee. Um, what I'm going to do now is actually work through a specific example. Um, I'm using real data. I don't know what the real answer is. So when we have a variety of estimates, close your eyes and pick your favorite. Um, I'll be showing you some R code, not because you can't do this in other packages, but just because that's what I use. And the R code that I'll be showing you is what I call the sort of the dumb code. It's not efficient or beautiful, but it's been written <laughs> to make it easy to understand so that if you use Stata or SAS or something else, hopefully you'll have a good idea of what it is that I'm doing. I do rely on some specialized packages, so those, you know, I don't know if they're equivalents in other software. Um, but again, hopefully what I'm doing is sufficiently transparent to at least give you an idea of how to actually fit the estimators that we discussed in the last session. So the goals for this session are slightly more relaxed and lighter session here is how do we fit a propensity score? How can we check if it's any good? So how do we assess balance? And then once we have a propensity score that we think is good enough, how can we fit an average treatment effect or an average treatment effect on the treated? So I'll start out by fitting a propensity score. I'll use logistic regression. I'll show you how I've checked for balance. And briefly, we'll discuss alternatives to logistic regression. I'll then move on to fitting an average treatment effect. Uh, start out by using traditional regression. Sometimes in the statistics literature, you'll see this called g-computation. It's not. It's Well, it is, but in a one-time point setting, it's nothing more than regression. Uh, we'll look at propensity score stratification, matching, regression, and inverse weighting. And then I'll show you how to fit an average treatment effect using propensity score matching and inverse weighting. Um, I have not really seen any convincing way of fitting an average treatment effect on the treated using stratification or regression. It's harder to, to do, really. So we'll see why that is and, and how we can do it using these other methods. So again, we want a causal effect of an exposure Z on outcome Y. Z we're viewing as something manipulable. We have other confounders X. And we're thinking about potential outcomes with a main quantity of interest being the average potential outcome or the expected value of Y if I forced everyone in my population to have treatment level Z. And we want to be able to estimate this using a random sample of data XZY, assuming a binary exposure Z. And we saw earlier this morning that in propensity score-based methods, the goal of this treatment model isn't actually to learn about treatment, but rather to eliminate imbalance in the distribution of the confounders or the covariates between treated and untreated subjects. Okay, so we want to achieve balance only on those confounders. Doing so on other covariates, like, for example, strong predictors of treatment, is unhelpful. Think of it as a principle of laziness. Why bother if you don't need to? It's more work, and it turns out it gains you nothing. So our goal isn't to build an excellent predictive model. And with that in mind, we don't want to use things like C statistics to see if we've got a good treatment model, because it doesn't tell us that. That just tells us if we have a good predictive model. Similarly, we don't want to use significance tests to test whether there's a difference between treated and untreated groups for a particular covariate. So age, for example. I could look at a t-test for age among treated and untreated individuals in my original sample. And then I could go ahead and match and look at a t-test and say, aha, it's not significant. But if I was very strict on my matching criteria, it may not be significant because I have reduced my sample size and I just don't have the power to detect an effect. So tests of significance are not necessarily the way to go to decide whether we've achieved balance. Now, a common measure of balance is what's known as the standardized mean difference or proportion. And it's effectively like a Wald statistic or a t-test type statistic where we're looking at the difference in means divided by 
a pooled variance. There are unpooled versions, there are slightly different versions, but they all come down to the same sort of idea of looking to see whether when standardizing by variability, we have a quote unquote big difference in our treated and untreated groups. Okay, and we can look at this both in weighted and unweighted samples. Another way to assess balance when we have continuous confounders is to look at empirical CDFs. Okay, we can look at the CDF and the treated and untreated and see whether they lie on one another or not. So now we'll go through a specific example. And while there are many permutations of, of what I could have done, I, I wanted to give you sort of an overview of the basics. So I may well have missed some details. I may, I've certainly done more analyses than I would ever do if I had a real problem, because frankly, I will not come up with five estimators and then choose one at the end. I, I pick the estimator that I think is best and proceed with that. But um, the example that we're going to look at is using publicly available data. So you can download these data. You can try it out yourself. It's from the United States National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey. So you can get this freely available in R through the NHANES package. Uh, the other packages that I'll be using from R are table one and matching. Table one is just a really nice wrapper package that effectively produces a table one. I don't know whether this exists in state or SAS, but anyone can do this tediously by hand themselves. Um, matching, there certainly are different matching functions available in both SAS and R. They probably have different options and defaults. But uh, I'm sure with sufficient work, we could work out what they are and, and come up with a comparable analysis. So I'm going to focus the question of whether current smoking affects average systolic blood pressure. It's not a very exciting question, but we also probably have some idea of what we expect the answer to be. So the variables that I'll look at are BP cis av, that's the average systolic blood pressure. It's averaged over three days. Current smoking is called smoke now. Gender, age, race, education, marital status, and poverty will be the variables I consider as potential confounders. I actually also have included a different indicator of socioeconomic status, which is household income. But I won't predict, um, present the balanced statistics for that one simply because it makes the tables too big. So it's included in there, um, but you won't be seeing statistics for that one. And finally, I'm going to uh, restrict attention to adults greater than 17. So NHANES has children almost down to newborns in them. So we'll just focus on adults here. So I get my data, and I load the two libraries that I plan to use. Um, in, and again, some of these details are not particularly interesting, but if you want to reproduce the, the analysis, I just wanted you to, to see what pre-processing I did, which was pretty minimal. Uh, smoking is coded 1, 2 in the NHANES data set, so I took off 1 to make it binary. And for the sake of simplicity, I'm just doing a complete case analysis on the variables that I have. So I restricted to the survey year 2011 and 12. I restricted to individuals greater than 17. And I kept only those variables I plan to analyze. And then I dropped anyone who had missing information. Not a smart plan, I completely admit it. But we're focusing on just the causal methods rather than the missing data methods. Now, I'm creating here a list of the variables whose balanced statistics I want to present to you. So as I said, while I do use household income, I'm not going to present that one to you, so it's not in this list. Using the table one package, there's a function called create table one, which as I said, does the tedious work for me. So I'll show you the output. But what table one does is it takes the variable names or the variables whose names that I've just specified Tells, I tell it how to stratify, so looking in smokers and non-smokers, which data set, and I tell the function I don't want any t-tests or other significance tests. So the output of this gives me, as I said, a reasonably tidy version of a table one, where I have the non-smokers and the smokers. And it also provides me that standardized mean difference statistic. Okay, so. 
we can see that smokers are more likely to be male. Somewhat surprisingly, they seem likely to be younger. Maybe the older ones have uh, deceased already, I'm not sure. But if that's what we're seeing, we're seeing um, more, let me see, fewer, fewer whites among them non-smokers, uh, more black individuals, and then the other race categories, the numbers are relatively small, so it's hard to make much sense of it. Okay, and this table goes on. You can see why I didn't include more variables. Two slides is more than enough. Okay, so what we also see is that our smokers, uh, by and large, have, are less likely to be college graduates, uh, more likely to have never married, and the poverty index is measured such that lower value means more poverty. So we have more poverty or a lower socioeconomic status among our smokers. Now this standardized mean difference you can see here ranging from 5, uh, 0.512 on this slide down to a low of 0.14 on the previous slide. You think, okay, well, what does that mean? And it's generally taken in the literature to be considered sufficiently small if the standardized mean difference is 0.1 or less. That's kind of going on the, the rough rule of thumb of the the Cohen effect sizes. So 0.1 or less is considered small. It's a small enough difference relative to the variability in our data set. So what I'm seeing in this table is imbalance that I'm not satisfied with on all of the covariates. Right? 0.14 is the smallest standardized mean difference. So I'm seeing quite a lot of imbalance in the distribution between my smokers and non-smokers. Now, I only have one continuous covariate here, which is age. And so for that one continuous covariate, what I can do is plot an empirical CDF. So we can see the distribution in smokers and non-smokers. And while we don't have any measure of variability on this plot, my eyeballs tell me that those are not lying on top of one another. I see a difference in distributions, which again is telling me that we have imbalance. So what am I going to do? I'm going to try constructing a propensity score. So I'm going to take the simplest approach I can, which is to fit a logistic regression where in my logistic regression, I'm looking at current smoking as the outcome, and all of my covariates that are potential confounders are included as predictors. A family equals binomial just means I'm fitting a logistic regression. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to output my predicted probability. Okay, so I fit a logistic regression, and then I predict the probability that you are a smoker based on your covariates. Okay, and I can look at the distribution of the propensity score, and I can also compare the propensity score among the non-smokers and smokers, just by comparing box plots side by side. And what I will then do is overlay on these two box plots the quintiles of my propensity score distribution. So what does this tell me? It tells me that if I want to do a stratified analysis, I probably have enough overlap in each of my quintiles to do so. Probably, it's hard to tell from a box plot. So I can look at the numbers. And what I see is that in my lowest quintile, I have only 47 smokers, but that is the strata that has the smallest number in one of the cells. So I feel pretty good about doing a, a simple analysis in that stratified sample. So I think, okay, I've checked for overlap, I've checked that I have sufficient numbers, but is my propensity score any good, okay? So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to look at the standardized mean difference within each of the strata, okay? And that's what I'm showing you in this plot here. In the first column, I have the standardized mean differences that were output from that table one. I just collected the last column of the table one for the standardized mean differences for each of my covariates. The next, Five columns are each of the quintiles. I have checked for covariate balance within each of the five quintiles among the treated and the untreated. 
So who likes what they see? Nobody, for those listening at home, nobody likes what they see. <laughs> Things don't look too bad for gender. You know, for most, most of the uh, quintiles, we're seeing sta uh, standardized mean differences close to 0.1 or less. So that doesn't look too bad. But the rest don't look great. We're still seeing quite a lot of imbalance. So what that tells me is that my strata aren't fine enough, that within those strata, I still have quite a lot of imbalance. Okay. And again, we can look at the empirical CDF plots. These get a little bit harder to assess as we start stratifying, because of course, they're based on smaller and smaller numbers. Right? And unlike the standardized mean differences, these plots don't give us any idea of the variability. So yes, I'd say these look better. These look quite a bit better than the plot for, sing for a single, um, sorry, for our original sample. But especially, I would say, in the first, fourth, and fifth quintiles, I'm still seeing some, some areas where we don't have overlap. The empirical CDFs are not lying one on top of the other. So I would say I have an achieved balance. Okay, my standardized mean differences are greater than 0.1 for at least three out of the five quintiles for every covariate that I was interested in. And the empirical CDFs of age also sort of back that up. They're, they're not overlapping for several quintiles. Now, that doesn't mean my propensity score is bad, necessarily. It might just mean that my strata aren't fine enough. So I could try looking in finer strata. I could look at deciles, for example. So this is the same box plot that you saw before, but now I'm overlaying deciles. And again, it looks as though we have reasonably good overlap. And it turns out we do. The smallest decile, again, is the first. And it has 20 smokers in it. So I'm not too worried about unstable estimates. So the question is, has balance been improved? And again, this code isn't especially exciting. But what I'm simply showing you is that I am looping through each of the deciles to calculate the standardized mean differences. And rather than presenting you a table that now has 10 columns in it, I'm simply going to look at a summary of those standardized mean differences. Right? If the max is small, I'm in business. It turns out it's not. Right? What I'm seeing is that the median is 0.3. So again, most of my deciles are showing standardized mean differences that I consider unacceptably large. I still don't have balance, even when I've looked at much finer strata. Okay? So again, this doesn't necessarily tell me my propensity score is bad, but it does tell me that I don't want to try a stratified analysis because I haven't achieved that local balance when I've looked at strata based on the propensity score. So I will actually, at some point later in this section, go ahead and show you the calculations based on the, uh, I think I do it based on the quintiles. But frankly, I would never do that. I, I'm doing it to show you how to do the calculation, but I never would because I, I don't have the balance here. And so I wouldn't expect that estimator to be unbiased. So. OK, we have a propensity score. We know that stratifying isn't going to be good enough. But we still haven't really assessed the quality of the propensity score itself. So we're going to look at matching and inverse weighting. OK. Now, I'm using a, a matching function in R. So in, R, in this function, I need to specify what my treatment is. So which two groups are going to be matched to one another. I have to tell the function what I want it to match on. In this case, I want it to match on the propensity score. Okay, So it's looking for individuals whose propensity scores are close. And I have to tell the function what type of matching I want to do. So the, if my estimand is an average treatment effect, the matching will be slightly different to if the estimand is an average treatment effect on the treated. If I'm interested in an average treatment effect on the treated, there will be, for each treated individual, this function will seek an untreated match. 
so that when I look at the distribution in my full match sample of covariates, it should look like the distribution of the covariates only in the treated population, so possibly sicker than the full population. In this case, I'm asking for an average treatment effect, so it's ensuring that both all of the treated and all of the untreated, we attempt to find a match. So when I look in my match sample, the distribution of covariates should look like the population distribution of covariates. So my matching is accomplished, and then I extract my match sample from this function. And just out of curiosity, I, I did matching with replacement, and you can see that there's a handful of people who are good matches. So there's a few people who are reused often, but by and large, people are not used too, too frequently. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to create my table one using the match data set and see what that looks like. Now I just want to point out for a second the function that I was using, that match function, also has an associated function with it called match balance. And it gives many, many more details than create table one. So create table one gives me a pretty table one. It gives me standardized mean differences. Match balance gives you more than you could ever want. Maybe some of it you do, maybe some of it you don't. It gives you means, medians, maximum difference between empirical CDFs. Same thing for empirical QQ plots. It will give you a Kolmogorov Smirnoff statistic, ratios of variances, p-values for t-tests. As I said, I'm very skeptical of, of things like t-tests, especially in a matching context, because matching can reduce your sample. And so you might have apparently good balance because you have non-significant t-tests, but that could just be due to a loss of power. The other thing to note is that this function produces standardized mean differences, but it scales them by 100. So if you look at the standardized mean differences coming out of this function, please do not panic. You haven't suddenly made balance you know, 100 times worse than you had before. It's just the way it's reported. So again, I'm going to look at my empirical CDFs and my standardized mean differences. And I will do the same thing following inverse weighting. So I create my inverse weights in the smokers. So my current smoking takes value one if you're a smoker. So for my smokers, I weight by the probability that you are a smoker. For the non-smokers, I weight by the probability of being a non-smoker. So the weighting is not by the inverse of the propensity score, but rather, rather by the inverse of the probability of getting your observed treatment. Okay, and we have to do a little bit of a fiddle to create our table one using this function because the standard create table one function doesn't accept weights. So that's all that's going on in that code. So let's see what this looks like now. Again, I have my original sample. I have my quintiles. And if I look at the balance under matching, it looks pretty good. Maybe not as good as I'd like it to be for race or education, but it's much, much better than in the original sample. And also, I would say, notably better than under stratification. Using inverse weighting, things are even better. Right? I've practically eliminated the differences between the treated and untreated. So if, as I've confessed, I have strong biases, okay? I like propensity score regression and I like inverse weighting. They have statistical properties that I like. So those are my go-to estimators. But if for some reason I was more agnostic about it and I decided to go to the trouble of computing this table, I would say, okay, based on what I'm seeing, my prejudices are confirmed and inverse weighting is the way to go. Or potentially propensity score regression. We don't have a good way of assessing whether we get good balance with propensity score regression the way we do here. But what this latter column suggests to me is that my propensity score model is doing a good job. I'm not worried that I have badly misspecified the propensity score because it's clear that I'm able to recover the, the balance between the treated and untreated groups.
And again, if I look at my empirical CDFs, on the left-hand side, we have the matched sample. On the right-hand side, it's the weighted sample. My eyes are happy, right? No, it's not perfect, but it's an awful lot better than it was in the original sample. Now, some authors have argued in favor of using more complex methods. Don't use logistic regression. It's a default. It's silly. It's no good. Let's use something fancier. Okay. So Richwin and McCaffrey, for example, recommended using generalized boosted models. Okay. Boosting, uh, the way it's implemented in R at least, it's effect effectively a, an ensemble of simple trees, very, very simple one parameter trees typically. Okay. So I could fit my propensity score using a GBM fit. Okay. And I could see whether this does any better. So I've used a fancier model. Again, it looks like I have reasonably good overlap, although it's not as good as it used to be. Right? My first quintile now only has 17 smokers in it. But who cares, because I'm not getting good balance, so I'm not going to do a stratified analysis. Okay, but if I look over to the matched and IPW columns, okay, we, we saw that we, we were not getting a fine enough stratification or good enough balance by stratifying. But at least when we used the logistic regression, we were seeing some pretty nice numbers here for matching an IPW. And it looks to me like we've made things worse. Okay, we're seeing less balance by using, well, I don't even know if GBM counts as a more complex model, but it's certainly a less familiar model to many researchers. So having done this, I'm throwing this propensity score in the bin and saying this is not the way I want to go. So I'm going to try one other approach. And I, I don't know whether um, how far north and west this approach has uh, proliferated. But super learning is the flavor du jour in a lot of causal inference now. Um, it's been around for maybe three or four years. It originated down in Berkeley. And super learning is basically the most ensemble ensemble learning package there is. Okay? What you can do with super learning is input any sort of prediction method you want. Um, in the example that I'm about to show, I used some nearest neighbor. You can use random forest. You can use GLMs. You can use simply mean matching. And basically, what it will do is use cross-validation to pick the best predictive model. Okay? It's much more flexible, much less linear than logistic regression. Um, for our purposes, that's neither good nor bad. But what is important to keep in mind is that SuperLearner is optimizing prediction, which may not be what we want to do. Okay? So I had to reformat the data slightly to make this work. As I mentioned, I've used nearest neighbor, random forest, simple GLMs, like I had in a logistic regression, and simple means. So these are the methods that I'm going to try to use to improve my propensity score. Okay. And again, I can get an outputted prediction, which is my propensity score. And I can check whether I've done a better job of achieving balance. So first, I'll show you the box plots of my propensity scores. And if you're not too tired from lunch, then you should all be getting horrible shivers up your spine because this looks bad. right? What I see here is in my top and bottom two quintiles, I've got nobody. I can't estimate a treatment effect. I can only estimate it here. And even there, that overlap doesn't look very good. It's going to be hard to find comparable people. Now, is that because really we had a very complex confounding situation that is better modeled by the super learner? I don't know. It's possible. Or it's possible I've just done a super good job of prediction, but I haven't done anything to address confounding. So. Stratified analyses are out the window here because four of our five strata 
don't have both treated and untreated individuals. See, I can only look at balance in the third quintile. And when I look, it's not good. It's worse than we had in the original sample, right? I have made things worse. I have more confounding now than I did before. If I look at the matched and IPW versions of the samples, again, there are some settings where it's worse. So gender is less balanced. Education is less balanced. Inverse weighting does a better job than the matching. But by and large, things don't look good. Now, I don't want to say that super learning is never something that you cons should consider. But what I would like the take home message to be is that fancier is not necessarily better, and accurate prediction is not our goal. Okay? Confounder balance is key. And it's the only thing that matters when we're trying to get an unbiased treatment effect. So if the boosted model is in the garbage, this one is in the garbage with the lid clamped on. Okay? We are not coming back to this propensity score and will not be using it again. So key ideas so far is we need to create or restore confounder balance. It can be hard to assess overlap or achieve balance in high dimensions. So the propensity score lets us do this in a simplified way. But fitting a model for treatment doesn't guarantee you've achieved balance. Okay? And how you use that model also matters. Because as I saw, the same propensity score model gave me great balance when I used inverse weighting, but didn't provide local balance when I was using quintiles. So even if I fit a model that looks good, I have to be careful in how I use it. All right, so now I'd like to move on to actually estimating my average treatment effect. And I'll do it in a variety of ways. I'll start off with regression, okay, simple outcome regression. We'll look at the propensity score methods, stratification, matching, regression, and inverse weighting. And again, I'm using that logistic propensity score because it gave us the best balance. <laughs> All right, so let's start off just looking at regression coefficients. If I do my least thoughtful analysis, I can look at the simple or naive impact of current smoking on blood pressure, and I can see a big effect, but no one would really do that, right? No one would assume that there are no confounders, so what we would really do is fit an adjusted model. Okay, and if I pull out the coefficient associated with smoking, it's quite a lot smaller than what we saw in the unadjusted model. And I think most of us would think that's credible, right? Because smoking is probably associated with a whole bunch of other things like poverty or lower income that might also have an impact on our blood pressure. All right, so let's use regression to get our average treatment effect. OK, so first I'm going to fit my conditional model. Blood pressure as a function of smoking and all of my covariates. I haven't done anything particularly smart or fancy with age. I just left it as a linear effect. But I may well have wanted to put some splines in or consider nonlinear terms. Now, an easy way to get at my average treatment effect is simply to predict the outcome in my population if I was forcing everyone to smoke and not to smoke. And an easy way to do this in R, and I imagine a number of other settings, is I am replicating my data set. So I've created a data set here, which is NHANES all smoke. So first, what I've done is just set that equal to my original data set. And then I've made everyone a current smoker without changing any of their other covariates. And I did the same thing again. I created an NHANES no smoke where nobody is a smoker. Okay. So then I can get my average potential outcome based on my linear model, assuming everybody smokes, by getting the predicted fit from the all smoking data set. And I do the same thing for the no smoking data set. The difference between those two things is my average treatment effect. And what is it? It's the same as my coefficient from the regression model, okay? which is what you'd expect 
in a linear regression. My conditional and marginal effects are the same as long as I don't have an interaction. If I wanted to include an interaction, we would see something slightly different. So in this model, I included interactions between smoking and household income, gender, and age. Again, I get my average potential outcome assuming everyone smoked and assuming nobody smoked. And I look at the difference, and I see something slightly different from the coefficient for my regression model. Okay? I am averaging over the distribution of age, sex, and household income, those specific effects. So I hope I have just shown you or convinced you that if you can model this well, linear regression is good enough. Okay? I get very, very upset when people tell me they must use a causal method to get a causal answer because there is no such thing as a causal method, per se. There are things that are labeled causal methods, I'll admit. But we just did a causal analysis. I had to assume that my outcome regression model was right. But I'm always going to have to assume some model is right. So if I'm willing to assume that I can accurately model blood pressure, then I've done a causal analysis. I've given you an average treatment effect estimate. OK. Let's look now at propensity score stratification. Okay, I've created my quintiles. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to cycle through each of my quintiles and just calculate a simple average. Average among the smokers, average among the non-smokers, and then I take the difference of the two. Okay? So I get an effect of smoking on blood pressure in each of my quintiles, and then I take a weighted average of those. As you can see, there's a big variability in my treatment effects among the quintiles. That's a little bit worrying, right? Because what it's telling me is that things look really different from the people who are most and least likely to smoke. But if I'm after a full population average effect, then I should indeed be averaging those, keeping in mind that it's a very heterogeneous effect across my population. OK? So the calculations I've done here are everything you need to do. Is this an answer I believe? Not very much, because I saw I didn't have balance. Right? I'm not happy with this analysis, not because it's stratification, but because stratification didn't give me local balance. So what about matching? I've got that matched sample. This is just replicating the code we had earlier. Okay, I can look at how many individuals I have to make sure that everybody was matched. And in a matched sample, analysis is easy. Okay, I just need to check the mean and the treated and the untreated, because I believe, hope, assume, check that the distribution of the confounders is the same in the two groups. And we're seeing something pretty different here from what we saw before. It's certainly different from the regression analysis. I don't have standard errors on any of these, so I don't know whether it's significantly different. But it's, it's giving me a, a somewhat different effect, although still at least in the same direction, which is reassuring. OK, what about propensity score regression? This analysis that I'm doing at the top is not one I would ever actually do in practice. I'm regressing my outcome, blood pressure, on my exposure smoking, and on propensity score as a linear function. I generally would do something more complex than that, which is what I do in the next two analyses. In the second analysis, I'm looking at just including a quadratic term. In the third analysis, I look at putting some splines on my propensity score. Because if you'll recall, for propensity score regression, we needed to have both the propensity score model right and the outcome regression model right. And if I don't know what that outcome regression model should be, then I'll be as flexible as I think I can get away with. As it turns out, it doesn't make much difference. Okay? The fact that my splines are giving me almost the same answer as treating the propensity score as a linear term probably suggests that it's not very nonlinear. 
And if I'm misspecifying that model, it's pretty subtly, I would say. Okay, so we're seeing effects in the ballpark of minus 1.1, no matter how we model the propensity score. And this is actually, if I recall, most similar to the effect that we saw in our very first analysis. Is that right? Where is my first analysis? So when we were looking just at regression, yeah, we had one, minus 1 1.09. So again, that's telling me my, we have some concordance between the two models. So if I think I modeled the blood pressure correctly, then this is telling me I'm also doing a reasonably good job of replicating that result. <clears throat> now what about inverse weighting? Again, I have created my weights, and all I need to do is create a simple difference of averages. Okay? I'm now weighting my data, so I'm taking the smokers, and I'm taking an average of their weighted systolic blood pressure, and subtracting from that the mean of the average systolic blood pressure, the weighted mean in the non-smokers. I'm getting rather a bigger effect here. I can also do this weighted analysis through regression. So in regression, I take systolic blood pressure as a function of smoking and then put the weights into my OLS function. Why am I getting slightly different answers here? Because the linear regression model is forcing a common variance, whereas the simple average is not. Okay, so we're getting slightly different answers, but they're pretty close to one another. Okay, so we looked at different ways of balancing and different ways of performing regression. And what I'm doing here is now summarizing what I found. Okay, I, we've got the maximum mean and median standardized mean difference, and then the resulting average treatment effect. So for outcome regression, um, I guess I could have presented the standardized mean difference from the original sample, but I don't think that gives you an idea of whether or not my adjusted regression is actually achieving balance. So I don't think there's a, a really comparable way of presenting whether or not I've done a good job of this balance here. For quintiles, we saw that we had very poor balance, but for both matching and IPW, we had good balance. And we've got a variety of average treatment effects. Which one's right? I don't know. Maybe that's unsatisfying. If I had to tell you ahead of time what I would do, it would be one of these two. They're still relatively different. And again, as I've said, I haven't put standard errors on these, so I don't know if they're actually statistically different. But those are the two that I would lean towards. Um, basically based on the statistical properties of the estimator and not based on the numbers I'm seeing here. All right, so that's our analysis of the average treatment effect. But maybe we want to look at the average treatment effect on the smokers. Okay? Maybe there's people um, who would never, ever, ever smoke. Okay, they, are, they are the good compliers who listened to mom and dad and did everything, everything that they were supposed to. And those people will never be smokers, and so we, we, we don't necessarily want to know or are interested in the effect of smoking in that group. Why? Because if we could implement some public policy that somehow magically got rid of smoking, it wouldn't have any impact on those individuals, but it would over the wider population, or over the population of people who might smoke. So we want to ensure in a matching analysis that only the exposed individuals are matched. Okay? This is, of course, going to reduce our sample size, but so what? If it's reducing our sample size to the group of people to whom we want to make inference, then that's just fine. You know, if, if we're interested in an effect of some particular exposure in women, yes, I could estimate the effect in everybody, but half of my sample is not going to be relevant to the population I care about. Okay? So to do this with the matching function, I'm still inputting my exposure 
I'm still inputting my propensity score, but now I'm just letting the matching function know that I only want my treated individuals to find matches. Okay. So I can extract my sample and I see that I have a smaller sample size than when I was estimating the ATE because I'm focusing on a subset of the population. And when I look at the simple mean, I'm seeing something rather weird going on here. It looks very different from what I saw in the ATE. We can also estimate an average treatment effect by reweighting. And we do this by reweighting only the unexposed individuals because our target is the exposed. Our target are the smokers. So what we want to do is reweight our non-smokers so that their covariate distribution matches that of the smokers. Okay? So the way to create these weights is for my smokers, I'm not doing anything. It's a weight of one. But for my non-smokers, I'm going to weight them by the probability of smoking divided by the probability of not smoking. Okay. If you want to think about this again in important sampling terms, remember when we divided by the probability of the exposure that you actually had? It was a way of removing that specific distribution, trying to get you to the randomized setting, and then we want to sort of input the covariate distribution of the smokers. So we're sort of undoing the effect of being sampled from the non-smokers and making you look like the smokers. Okay, so once again, I can look at a simple weighted difference, and we're again seeing this negative effect. Okay, so our estimated ATT under IPW is in the same direction as for the ATE using all methods. Um, it had the opposite sign, and, and when I rerun the matched analysis, because if you rerun it, you'll get different matches, what I found was that the estimates varied quite significantly from one analysis to another. It could be as small as 0.24 and as big as 128. Sorry, 1.28. Now, does that mean it's wrong? Not necessarily, but it might give you some idea of why I'm not so keen on matching. It's a very variable procedure whose statistical properties are hard to understand. So in the ATT example, I've showed you how to compute the estimators, but we can also, again, look at our standardized mean differences. I only did this, again, in the matching and IPW setting. How would you do it for quintiles? Good question, right? It's hard to isolate the untreated people who look like the treated people without either reweighting them or, or matching. Okay? So you can see that we're, again, achieving reasonably good balance with matching and very good balance with IPW, except possibly in the case of race. Okay. Why is that one so hard to do? Largely because we have many categories with not very many people in it. So it's hard to rebalance that exactly. Um, I could get better balance by collapsing categories, but whether I want to do that or not is, is unclear. The other thing I wanted to show you just to, to really emphasize this is by looking at the stand, or my table one for my ATT analysis and weighting, you can see that my smokers are all whole numbers. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean that everyone, all of my smokers are just getting a weight of one, but my non-smokers are getting weights that could be all sorts of things. So that's how I end up with 15.4 Asians. Okay? It's, we're only reweighting the non-smokers, but not the smokers. Again, we can look at balance through empirical CDFs for the ATT, and both with matching and our weighting approach, we're getting reasonably good overlap. So the key ideas that I wanted to emphasize in this section is that from a coding perspective, all of these approaches are pretty simple. Some take three lines of code, some take five or 10, but I think we are all sufficiently mature in our statistical and epidemiological careers not to be scared off by an extra seven lines of code. Okay, they're pretty easy to do, but they're not all equally likely to satisfy the assumption of correct model specification. Okay. 
if you feel that you and your collaborators really understand your disease process, go for regression. I really genuinely advocate that because we understand the properties of those estimators. We understand how to check the models. And most cases, it's the likelihood-based estimator, so it's going to have the smallest variance. Okay? But if you have any doubt whatsoever, consider a propensity score, especially if you have a good understanding of how treatment was allocated. You can use it with augmented inverse weighting, which I, I probably should have shown but didn't. Um, and so you can get almost as good properties in terms of efficiency as you get with the outcome regression, or you can use propensity score regression. And again, we understand those methods well. We understand the properties of those estimators, and they're easy to implement. Okay? The real advantage to propensity scores, I think, is that they give you a much better and easier way of assessing balance and assessing overlap. That idea of no extrapolation, ensuring that positivity, is really hard to do if you don't have a propensity score. Who's really going to check every combination of covariates to see if they're treated and untreated individuals? So if, even if you want to do a regression, I think it's not a bad idea to fit the propensity score to look for that overlap, just to ensure that you really do have comparable treated and untreated individuals. And if you don't, maybe you need to redefine your sample to ensure that you're looking for an average treatment effect where you actually have support to estimate it. Now, how a propensity score is used in analysis also needs to be carefully considered. And I don't think you should judge it based on concordance between estimates. Okay, the matched estimator, we saw pretty good balance with matching. We saw much better balance with matching than we did with stratification, and yet the stratified estimator was closer to the IPW estimator. So don't go fitting five or six models and pick the one you think is best. Fit one that you think you can, um, that you understand its properties and who's offering you the balance that you need. Now, all of the propensity score approaches rely on substitution estimators, right? I don't know the propensity score. I had to estimate it. And then I used the coefficient estimates from my propensity score in a subsequent step. I used it to form strata. I plugged it in and used a propensity score as a covariate. Or I used plug-in weights in the IPW setting. So we do need to account for this when estimating our standard errors or confidence intervals. We can't pretend we knew it. And that's one thing I didn't show you here. We can derive these asymptotic variances. It's not that hard to do. It requires a handful of derivatives. So if you haven't done calculus lately, I don't recommend it. But if you don't have problems with derivatives, it'll take you 20 minutes to derive and probably at least another 20 minutes to code up. Okay, it's not that bad. They are, of course, asymptotic variances, so you want your sample size to be big enough to feel like you're in a large N setting. The easier approach by far is to bootstrap, but this only works for the smooth estimators. It doesn't work for matching. Okay. Now, I completely sidestepped missing data in this example. And that's another thing I think that's really important to remember is just because you are solving the confounding problem or you're using a causal method doesn't give you a pass on dealing with all of the other many, many problems you are likely to encounter in your data. Okay? You can deal with missing data methods using your favorite, or missing data, sorry, using your favorite missing data method. So the fact that you're using a propensity score doesn't change why or how you would deal with missing data. You could censor. So if somebody had, for example, um, a missing outcome but not missing covariates, you could treat that individual as censored, even in a one-time point setting, and use censoring weights, okay? much like you would in survey sampling. You, you upweight the available information so that they look like the entire sample. Okay? You, so you can use weighting. Oh, sorry, you can also use imputation. So multiple imputation, for example, is a very simple way of dealing with this. And multiple imputation can, again, be combined 
with bootstrapping to give you a full assessment of the variability that due both to the missing data methods and whatever causal or propensity score-based method you chose to use. So as I said, we, we sidestepped it here, but using a, a fancy or a causal method doesn't let you ignore all the other problems in your data. Measurement error is the same thing. You still need to think about it, deal with all of these issues if it's a significant problem in your data. So in any real data setting, we have to be sure that balance has been achieved. Model choices need to be based on subject matter knowledge to the greatest extent possible. And there's lots of sort of subtle and some not so subtle issues that remain, like how to do good variable selection for your propensity score. Um, there's really, I've seen one paper, actually it's not a paper. I have reviewed a paper that is not yet published that I thought was the closest I'd seen to coming to a solution, but it's, it's by no means a settled issue. Okay? There's, there's a lot of things that need to be dealt with. Matching is another one. There, there's absolutely no settled way of computing valid standard errors when you're using matching. So there are a number of difficulties that still need to be dealt with. Um, So I think what we will do now, if I may, is we're, we're finished with section three. And what I have generally found um, in section four, I talk a little bit about estimating equations and estimating functions. And I know for more than half of the statistical audience, that's not too bad. Um, but for at least some, it's not familiar. And for the non-statistical audience, you may or may not have heard of an estimating function. Um, and if you have, you may not really know what it is. So what I'd like to do now is give you sort of a six slide refresher slash introduction to what estimating functions are, because I'm going to use them and talk about them in section four. Okay, so for those here in the room or those following at home, I'm moving to the section for slides at the very end on slide 63. We have a crash course in estimating functions. If you are not mathematically inclined, you are more than welcome to take a deep breath, close your eyes, and ignore me. That is fine. Um, but I think these are really good fun. So if you're at all non-averse to equations, then, then here's the fun stuff. <laughs> all right, so there's two main approaches to inference. Okay? And you've always been told it's frequentist and Bayesian analysis, and I disagree. It's Bayesian and estimating functions. And estimating functions are typically done in a frequentist setting, but it involves a whole variety of different approaches, including semi-parametric estimators. So what is an estimating function? It's some sort of function of your data. That can be the y's, the x's, the z's, and some parameters that you want to estimate. And that function has to have the same dimensionality as your parameter and it has to have a mean of zero, okay? So those are my conditions on the function. That mean of zero is a mean under the true data gen generating uh, distribution. Now, an estimating function estimator is just a solution to taking the empirical average or the sample mean of that estimating function, setting it to zero, and solving for the parameters. Okay. And it turns out that if you've got a function that has these properties, right dimensionality, function of your data and your parameters, whose mean is zero, that's all you need to know. And I'll show you why it's all you need to know. Because we can find the frequency properties like variances using, well, we can find them first for the estimating function and then transfer those to the resulting estimator. Okay. Now, often the estimating function will be derived from a likelihood. Okay, who's ever used a score equation? 
A score equation is an estimating function. Right? You get a likelihood, you take the derivative, you set the derivative to zero because you know that setting the derivative to zero and solving gives you a maximum likelihood estimator. That's a very specific way, okay, getting that score function, it's a specific way of deriving an estimating function. There's other non-likelihood ways of doing it, and we'll look at one in the fourth section this afternoon. But all of this is to say that whether or not you knew it, you've been using score functions. Okay? If you use a linear model, you are using a score function. That's the basis of it. Okay? Bayesians do all sorts of extra, right? Where's, is my Bayesian still in the room? Oh, you left. All right, so. <laughs> Bayesians start with the likelihood. They add a bunch of extra information with their prior. I've never really seen a Bayesian function or a Bayesian estimation that doesn't have a likelihood in there somewhere, whereas you can have estimating functions that, don't, that are not likelihood-based. So we'll look at those later. Okay. So I've got my estimating function, and I want to solve for this empirical quantity here. I've got a sample average of this function for my data y. Uh, in this case, I'm using y to be all the relevant data. y could include the x's and the z's here, but I just didn't want to have all that in there. And it's the same dimension, and it has mean 0. Now, this quantity here is a random variable. Why is it a random variable? Because y is a random variable, and it's a function of y. Okay. If y is random, functions of y are random. Okay, so I've got a random variable here. As I noted, MLE is a special case of these. Okay, so I have a random variable, and already I know something about it. I know what its mean is. It has a mean of zero. That's helpful. Okay. Um, I have an n somewhere that I shouldn't. I'm sorry. On slide 66 in equation 3, the n should be after the u and not before. I apologize. OK. So I've got my estimating function. I set it equal to 0 to give me an estimating equation. So it's a random variable. It has mean 0. And if it has mean 0, then it's not hard to figure out what its variance is. right? The variance of a random variable is the expected value of the random variable minus its mean squared. In vector terms, it's the random variable minus its mean outer producted. Right? So that's what I'm doing here. I'm taking my estimating function minus its mean, but lo and behold, that is 0. So I just need the outer product of my estimating function, and I take its expectation. Okay. Now I also know that if I've got independent individuals, if my data is iid, then my estimating function is a sum of conditionally independent terms. So what do we know about adding up a bunch of independent things? We know it's going to be normal. So I suddenly know an awful lot. I started with a function which may or may not have been derived from a likelihood. And I realized that this function is normally distributed with mean 0 and a variance that I can hopefully calculate. Usually we can. Now, I, uh, I make this, yeah, you're laughing. See, I'm married to a Bayesian. I know. I don't know how we make it work, but we do. And he says to me, oh, you frequentists, all you do are Taylor series expansions. <laughs> and I roll my eyes at him. And then I go and do another Taylor series expansion. And for fun, I'll throw a delta method at it. OK, so that's what I do. I'm going to do a Taylor series expansion. And when I do that, I can get an expression not just for my estimating function, but for the parameter that I care about. OK, I can rearrange things in the way that we do. And I now have an expression for my parameter or my estimator of the parameter of interest. OK. What do I need to be able to do to get this? I need to be able to differentiate my estimating function. So I do need some smoothness here. Okay? I need to assume some regularity conditions. But if I can come up with this estimating function that has mean 0, it's really easy to derive its properties. Okay. 
So the main result that we get then is if I have a solution to an estimating equation, that estimator will be consistent and it will be normally distributed with a variance that I can handle. Okay, where does this variance come from? If I go back to slide 67 for a moment, we can see in this bottom equation I have theta hat minus theta. What mean should this have? Zero. Zero, right. So if I want to work out the variance of this, I'm in business again, right? Because I take the expected value of the square of the right-hand side, okay? Or the outer product if I'm dealing with vectors. So if I take that outer product, what I will get is the inverse of this derivative. I'll get a square of this middle term here, and then I'll have another one of these inverse derivatives over there. Okay? And that's what we're seeing in equation four here. I've got an A inverse B, A inverse. There's a transpose in there too. Okay, so my A is simply the expected value or the negative of the expected value of my derivative of the estimating function. B is giving me the variance of my estimating function. Okay, so this is usually called a sandwich estimator. My A's are the bread, my B is the cheese or the filling, whatever you happen to like in your sandwich. And you can see if you think back to score functions, this is doing exactly what you expect it to, right? The A inverse here, this is my inverse Fisher information. Okay, if I have a correctly specified likelihood, we know that the second derivative of my score function the inverse is equal to the square of the score both in expectation. So we get that the A inverse and the B cancel out, leaving you with the inverse of the Fisher information. So although this all feels new, any likelihood that you've been working with relies on this underlying theory. Okay, so that is all you will need to know certainly for my purposes, but probably all you'll need to know about estimating functions from here forward. Um, so I know we're a bit early, but I think this would be a good breaking point to stop for coffee and then come back for the um, both exciting and somewhat more intense section on longitudinal data and time-varying covariates, or time-varying treatments.